everyone. Welcome back to Forward Therapy and happy April. And since it is now a new month, you know what that means. We're back for another CHT prep practice questions. If you're new here, check out my last three videos. I've been doing this all through 2024 every month um, and still trying to find the groove. Um, I think the format from last month's video worked really well from what I have gleamed from everybody that has responded to my uh, request to tell me what you guys want in this type of video. Um, so we're going to keep the format very similar here. So just to remind you how it's going to work, make sure you grab a pen, pencil, paper, or your computer so that you can write down your answers. We'll go through every question. I'm going to read the questions out and the answers. You know, take the time if you need to pause the video for more time. And then after all 15 questions, we'll uh, go back through each question and talk through the correct answer. So make sure that you are ready for that when it comes. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get into these practice questions for April. Question one. A 35-year-old patient presents with inflammation of the skin and joints, pitted nails, reduced motion of the PIP joints on both hands. The therapist notes skin patches of thick red and scaly skin. Which of the following diagnoses is likely for this patient? A, osteoarthritis, B, rheumatoid arthritis, C, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, or D, psoriatic arthritis. Question two, after a nerve injury, a patient is able to detect moving touch. Which of the following sensory nerve return stages would follow this? A. Vibration 30 CPS B. Static touch C. Vibration 256 CPS D. Localization of touch Question 3. In evaluating a patient after distal radius fracture, the therapist discovers that PIP flexion is greater with the MCP joint flexed in comparison to when the MCP joint is fully extended. What does this indicate? A, extrinsic tightness. B, oblique retinacular ligament tightness. C, joint capsule contracture. Or D, intrinsic tightness. Question four. In a patient with suspected medial collateral ligament elbow tear, how would the therapist perform a stress to test the anterior bundle? A, valgus stress test with the elbow at 30 to 60 degrees of flexion. B, varus stress test with the elbow at 45 to 60 degrees flexion. C, valgus stress test with the elbow at mid-range to 140 degrees flexion. Or D, varus stress test with the elbow at 90 to 140 degrees flexion. Question 5. Which of the following elements of rehabilitation are appropriate for a patient with a lateral collateral ligament repair? A. Early range of motion needs to be completed in supination to avoid varus stress. B. An orthosis should immobilize the patient for four weeks. C. Elbow range of motion in extension should be limited to 30 degrees initially. D. Dynamic stabilization of the wrist flexor muscle group will provide stability. Question 6. After a distal biceps repair, when can pain-free strengthening be initiated? A. 4 to 6 weeks. B. 6 to 8 weeks. C. 8 to 12 weeks. D. 10 to 12 weeks. Question 7. A patient presents with lateral elbow pain. A thorough assessment reveals a positive Cozen's test, pain with resisted extensor, extensor digitorum communis, and composite wrist and digit flexion on the affected extremity is 20 degrees less than the contralateral side. Which of the following interventions would likely be the first implemented in the treatment plan? A. Passive wrist flexion stretches to promote improved muscle tendon unit length. B eccentric wrist extension exercises with a low load and high repetitions. C, refer, the, refer to the physician for a cortisone injection. D, 
activity modification education to avoid lifting objects with the forearm supinated. Question eight. What best describes a Galeazzi fracture? A, fracture of the proximal third of the ulnar and dislocation of the radial head. B, fracture of the radial head, coronoid process, and avulsion of the medial or lateral collateral ligament. C, fracture of the radial head with proximal migration of the radius. D, fracture of the radial shaft with dislocation of the distal radial ulnar joint. Question nine, what is the most common reason for skin graft failure? A, hematoma. B, dehiscence. C, edema. D, desiccation. Question 10. A therapist plans to utilize laterality training for a patient that presents with hyperalgesia, edema, asymmetrical hand color, and decreased range of motion. Laterality training is one component of A. Desensitization B. Graded motor imagery C. Stress loading D. Physical agents Question 11. Which activity promotes a spherical grasp in essential hand function? A. Grasping a dowel B. Carrying a grocery bag C. Holding a baseball D. Turning a key Question 12. A patient complaining of paresthesias in the right arm reports resolution of symptoms when resting the arm on top of the head. This finding is a positive result of which special test? A. Spurlings. B. Cervical distraction. C. Ruse. D. Bacodes. Question 13. A patient presents with a nerve palsy. The patient has weak elbow flexion in supination and decreased sensation along the radial forearm. Which of the following nerves is involved? A. Long thoracic nerve. B. Suprascapular nerve. C. Musculocutaneous nerve. Or D. Axillary nerve. Question 14. A therapist has been treating a patient with an ulnar nerve palsy for three months. The patient returns to the clinic and the therapist notes increased clawing of the fourth and fifth digits. What is the mechanism responsible for this increase in symptoms? A. Progression to a high-level lesion. B. FDP and the intrinsic muscles are not intact. C. Lumbricals are not intact. FDP is intact. Or D adductor pollicis and the first dorsal interossei are not intact. And last one, you guys made it. Question 15. A 12-year-old female has significant stiffness after sustaining a metacarpal shaft fracture. The therapist is creating a treatment plan and would like to use a modality to decrease joint stiffness and increase extensibility of collagen-rich tissues. Which of the following modalities would not be an appropriate choice for this patient? A. Paraffin wax. B. Therapeutic ultrasound. C. Fluidotherapy. D. Cryotherapy. Okay, awesome job, everybody. Congrats, you made it through all 15 questions. If you need a little bit more time to go back through your answers or, um, you know, solidify, make sure that you pick an answer for each question, commit to it, and go ahead and pause the video if you need to here. Now we are going to go back through every question. I'm going to give you the answer and a little bit of a rationale uh, for why that answer is correct of all the choices. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so for question one, the correct answer is D, psoriatic arthritis. Um, When you look back at different types of arthritis, really the tip off here is that thick red and scaly skin patches um, that, you know, is a classic sign of psoriatic arthritis. So if you were unsure about this question, I would just go back and kind of review different types of arthritis. For question two, the correct answer is B. Uh, when recovering from a nerve injury, the sensations come back in different stages. And after uh, moving touch, the next thing that comes back is actually static touch. 
question three, the answer is D, intrinsic tightness. So to test for intrinsic tightness, that is the position that you want to test in. Um, you're going to compare PIP flexion with the MCP joint flexed uh, versus when the MCP joint is fully extended. And if it is greater with the MCP joint flexed, then when the MCP joint is fully extended, it's an intrinsic stretch or intrinsic tightness. If the opposite is true, so if the PIP movement is actually greater with the MCP joint in full extension versus when the MCP joint is flexed, that would actually be extrinsic tightness. Uh, when a joint capsule contracture is present, the PIP motion will be the same no matter the position. So that's how you can di distinguish between those. Question four, the correct answer is A. Um, it is the medial collateral ligament that we're trying to test for, so we know it's a valgus stress test, not varus. And then you want to position it in 30 to 60 degrees to stress the anterior MCL the most. To stress the posterior MCL, you would test it in mid-range to 140 degrees of elbow flexion. Question five, the correct answer was C. With an LCL repair, we want to splint at about 90 degrees flexion um, with pronation or neutral positioning. Early range of motion should be started in neutral to pronation, not supination, because that is a more stressful position on the LCL. Uh, and dynamic stabilization of the wrist extensor group will provide stability, not the flexors. Question six, uh, the answer is C, eight to 12 weeks. Of course, this is all dependent on the surgeon, but in general, eight to 12 weeks is recommended for strengthening in a pain-free range. Question seven, the answer is A. This information provided in the question suggests lateral epicondylitis. So of all the options available, the most appropriate is gonna to be to start with the wrist flexion stretching. Um, I did put in like a little tricky question uh, or a little tricky answer, uh, answer D. Um, because that's a something that I would have <laughs> read very quickly and you know been like oh I think it's that one activity modification um, but if you look closely it says avoid lifting objects with supination and that is actually the safer way to do it so sorry if I tricked you um, but I definitely would have been tricked by this. Question eight, the answer is D, a fracture of the radial shaft with dislocation of the distal radial ulnar joint um, this is a good opportunity to s review those different fracture types. So the, you know, A, the fracture of the proximal third of the ulnar and dislocation of the radial head is a, a Montagia fracture. B, the fracture of the radial head, coronoid process, and then avulsion of the medial or lateral collateral ligaments, which leads to dislocation, is a terrible triad. And then Essex Lopresti is the fracture of the radial head with proximal migration of the radius because the interosseous membrane ruptures. Question nine, what is the most common reason for skin graft failure? The answer is A, hematoma. Question 10, the correct answer is B, graded motor imagery. The components of that are laterality training, motor imagery, and mirror training. Um, desensitization, stress loading, and physical agents can all be used for patients who present with these hyperalgesic symptoms um, or symptoms that maybe sound like possible CRPS. Question 11, the answer is C for spherical grasp. It is holding a baseball. Uh, grasping a dowel would be a cylindrical grasp. Carrying groceries is a hook. And then turning a key is lateral pinch. Question 12, the correct answer is D, Bacodes. Uh, this is uh, talking about brachial plexus and thoracic outlet. Um, Spurlings is a test for cervical radiculopathy where the examiner applies an axial load or compression on the head to compress the cervical um, roots. Cervical distraction is when the examiner will distract the head, obviously, and then ruse uh, is that elevated stress test where both arms are up in the 90 abduction and external rotation position. The patient will open and close their hands. Question 13, the correct answer is C, musculocutaneous nerve. Um, the long thoracic nerve is going to be involved with serratus anterior, so scapular winging, uh, suprascapular nerve is going to supra and infraspinatus, and then the auxiliary nerve is going to the deltoids. 
Question 14, the ulnar nerve palsy. The correct answer here is C. Um, the symptoms that are provided in the question suggest that this patient is progressing from a high level to lower level injury. And as the nerve heals, the FDP will get re-innervated, but the lumbricals have not yet been innervated. And so FDP is now unopposed, which will lead to increased clawing of those fourth and fifth fingers. And last question, question tw uh, 15, I almost said question 12, uh, I'm like reading the question in my mind. Um, anyway, question 15, the answer is B, therapeutic ultrasound that is contraindicated for children, for kids. So just be careful with your modalities, make sure that you know um, that uh, contraindications and precautions for each type of modality.